So I'm going to get myself a 6x6 Land Cruiser. Decided. You know where I got the inspiration from? No, not from this. This is far heavier than my Land Cruiser is going to be. <clears throat> I got my inspiration because the United States of America, and that's where I am now, it's San Francisco, down Fisherman's Wharf, and they have these brilliant ships. And what a lovely sense of history. The United States is the place of the pickup. In fact, the dirtier your pickup is, the more manly you are. I'm not quite there yet, but I am in pickup country. And the fact that the 6x6 Land Cruiser is in fact a pickup, and I have to develop and design a camper that's going to bolt onto the back of it, I thought there is no better place on the planet to come to to find out how to do that. And where is the best place to find out how to design this? Well, I want it as a live-in, live-out-of camper. And if I'm living in it some of the time in bad weather, then I'm living in quite a cramped condition, aren't I? Well, I thought, well, where could I, I mean, how could I find out about life in cramped conditions? I'm Andrew St. Pierre White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and traveling to the remotest parts of the world. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe and remember to hit that notifications bell to make sure you catch our weekly videos. The 6x6 spoken of is this. I've just returned from an expedition in Oman driving a Toyota Land Cruiser pickup six-wheel drive. I'm so impressed with it that I'm going to build one for myself. But mine will have four doors and a full camper conversion on the back. So I've come to the USA to begin my development research. And I'm traveling with my wife, Gwyn, who's going to be spending a lot of time in this camper, so her ideas and help will be vital. 1942, that's where we are now. Sorry, not quite right. USS Pampanito was launched in 1943 and is now preserved by the San Francisco Maritime National Park. The boat is berthed near Fisherman's Wharf. She completed six tours during World War II between 1944 and 45, and then served as a training ship from 1960 to 1971. She's 95 meters long and weighs in at 1,526 tons. Okay, lesson number one, keep all hard, sharp objects high up. Oh, oh dear, that's better. I'm a bit scared of, scared of pressing of the buttons here in case it accidentally shoots a torpedo and sinks the Jeremiah O'Brien. Forgive me for a moment while I indulge my love of ships. The Jeremiah O'Brien has an even more illustrious history. She is a Liberty ship, a rare survivor of the 6,939 ship armada that stormed the Normandy beaches on D-Day in 1944. Amazingly, she is kept in ocean-going condition and returned to France on the 50th anniversary of the D-Day landings, the only large vessel from the original landings to return. You know, <clears throat> there, is, there is one other place that I can think of that would be even better in learning about living in cramped conditions. Alcatraz! Back in San Francisco, and the real reason I'm here. Not far away in Sacramento, California's state capital, is four-wheel pop-up campers. I'm going to be taking one of their campers out for a few weeks in an effort to find out why in this country they love their campers so much. Four-wheel campers CEO Tom Hannigan introduces me to my home for the next two weeks. So this will be your truck for the next couple of weeks right over here. It's a Toyota Tundra. 
a little bit of an older style. I'm very excited. Very, very excited. Uh, we've got the BF Goodrich uh, uh, KO2s, a later version. Brilliant. Um, it doesn't look particularly heavy, all alloy frame, but how heavy is it? And how will this not overly large pickup handle it? The payload of the vehicle is in the realm of around 1,500 pounds. The camper itself, the one you have on your truck, is right around 1,100, a little between 1,100 and 1,200 pounds. So you've got a little bit of cushion there, but what we've done is by adding in airbags and the rear suspension, yeah, okay. as well as the beefed up leaf springs, you're in very, very fine shape. Oh, wow. Good. Very, very good. Very good. Very good. Okay. I am so excited about this. Another opportunity to go overlanding in the USA. My plan is to go camping in the Californian forests and then travel through the lowest and hottest parts of the country in Death Valley. After that, I'll end it all in the not so touristy parts of the Grand Canyon. And all that before attending the Overland Expo West in Arizona. So we've arrived at our first stop. This is the Big Basin Redwoods Park just south of San Jose, which it is just south of San Francisco. And I've got with us a four-wheel pop-up camper. I've chosen the four-wheel because it's, it's very popular in, in, in the US, uh, but it's, it's quite simple, it's quite straightforward. It really is designed to be bolted on and then taken off when the vehicle is being used for other things. So it is fully self-contained. It's got lots of bits in it that look very interesting and that I think I can learn a lot from it. And why I've come to this particular place is, well, my love of trees and that from here, we're actually heading into the desert. There are no trees. We're going to Death Valley. So I thought I would get a good, strong tree fix before we head into the desert. We are surrounded by all uh, four of the most common trees found in these forests. These forests extend for miles over this part of California. To me it's such a surprise that there are there is such a large area covered in this these ancient forests. But they're not really ancient. These are actually quite new forests by comparison with many of the other forests in California growing the more common sequoia, the giant sequoia. There are fewer giant sequoia here. Most of these trees are the Coast Redwood. Now, at the gate, they give you these things about all the different trees and everything. Coast Redwoods. That's, these are Coast Redwoods here. Okay. Their conservation ethic in these forests is very strict. So much so that this is designated a crumb-free area. And that's because the, uh, the crows and ravens um, are very harmful to local endangered bird species and by attracting them with crumbs on the picnic table you're actually doing harm to the environment so they're very very strict on that in fact I had to sign a little note saying that I would take care and I wouldn't leave crumbs around and I would actually pay attention to their their requests to look after the local wildlife I thought that was quite nice that is the straightest tree in the world well, there you have it. After the first night camping in our four-wheel camper, we are now going to go and interview the most important person at the campsite and find out how she enjoyed the can and the night's camp. How did you enjoy the night's camp? Did you enjoy the night's camp? Be was, honest now. It was fantastic. There you go. You have it, ladies and gentlemen, from the... I was going to say horse's mouth. Don't hit me. Fact is, it was absolutely fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant. And, you know, we, we got into bed and we, and we put up the thing... And, we couldn't stop talking about our own project and how we would do this and how, and there are, and I honestly thought that when I'm first looking at this, that there would not be a lot of elements in this design that I would take for mine. I was wrong. There are lots and lots of elements I'm going to nick from this in terms of its design. It's got some very nice features. But one of the, the things that is very, very obvious to me is that there are Southern Hemisphere campers and there are Northern Hemisphere campers, and they're quite different. And later on, I'll explain why. 
At this point in our journey, we are joined by Jeremy James, a good friend of mine, who lives in the northwest of the United States. From a child, he's explored these forests. Really kind of meaty mushroom. They've got a stem that's about the color of this wood, and they only stand about three inches tall. We're looking for mushrooms. Yes, mushroom soup. For steak with mushroom sauce. And, uh, you clean them, and then you put a little egg wash and some panko breading and fry them up and eat them with ranch dressing. It's fantastic. Yum! And they kind of blend in, so it's hard to find, but once you initially find one or two... Feels like a bit like fishing. You know, when I go fishing, I eat steak for supper, looking for mushrooms. Guess what we're having for supper, or not having for supper. I was wrong. Here they are. Oh dear. Jeremy's just told me that they're the wrong ones and that these are tasteless. So our search continues. Well, there you go. Our first night camp as I begin my expedition to discover the delights of outback wilderness, California. This is Lake Isabella. When people talk to me about travel in Africa, I've spent 38 years traveling through the most remotest parts of Southern Africa. And they ask me and, and they, they'll say, how safe is it? And I'll, uh, I'll respond by saying, well, what specifically are you worried about? Is it, you know, and most commonly they'll say animals, specifically snakes. Well, how many close encounters have I had with snakes uh, over the last 38 years in Africa? I can count them on one hand and only one very close encounter. Maybe two. This is my third year in a row. I've visited Northern, uh, North America. And guess what? This evening, as we were setting up camp, what a delight. A magnificent, a magnificent snake just crawling up over the rocks here as we're setting up our camp. I think it's a kind of adder, I'll identify it for you uh, and put the name at the bottom, but magnificent. Last year, second night camp, California kinsnake, right there. So if I had to ask, answer the question, which continent has more snakes? I'm sorry, it has to be North America. So first night, may I introduce you to Jeremy, Jeremy from Seattle, good friend and uh, our guide, well, our host, <laughs> our host in California and Arizona. And I bet you're wondering, what is he cooking? Laughing? No, sorry, not mushrooms, something else. We didn't find a single one. Can I pick a campsite or what? I mean, I don't mean to boast. And in this case, it was 100% luck. And the last time I was at a magnificent campsite, it was 100% because of somebody else's knowledge, local knowledge. But somehow, I keep finding myself in magnificent locations. This is Lake Lillian. Um, it's not far from the town of Bakersfield, California. And we're heading uh, to Death Valley. Now, what I wanted to do was to uh, experience um, broad varieties of landscapes in, in California. What could California offer? California is unbelievably diverse, and we're only going to see one or two uh, different aspects of it. I mean, the, the, the Sierra Nevadas that are incredibly high mountains, there are glaciers, real glaciers, genuine glaciers. Uh, there are, I mean, lakes and spots like this. Very, very um, lonely and quiet this morning because we're well out of school holidays. Um, and of course the, the, the huge forests and magnificent trees. And of course deserts. Death Valley.
down every golden road, paved in fallen souls. People strive and struggle for their dreams. It's a sordid, sour game, fools and foul are all in play. Fix us in, we're heading up this street. When you're broken down, far away, forsaken towns, weary by the weak link in your chain. One whimper or a sound, the better days are surely crowned. Better hold your hope, hold tighter on the ring. Under skies full of fire, burning embers fall instead of rain. See me there, I aspire, hanging on to all my feeling veins. Well, lessons we are sold in the fabled tales of old. Bow your heads, get on your knees and pray. While calling out his name, turn his sin and soul to sin. You know, trouble sure to find and cause it. This is actually a public <coughs> campsite run by the, uh, the National Park. Uh, this is a conservation area. There are three open camping lots, $20 a night. The only facilities are long drop toilets, but it's very wild. And you know, wild camping in the United States is very, very popular. And in fact, I can't think of a country, I certainly don't know of another country, where there are so many opportunities to wild camp. And Last year I was in Arizona, the same thing, wild camping opportunities all over the place. California looks like the same thing. Right, navigation for the four days through Death Valley is up to me. Nick Watson on Facebook heard that I was going and he offered his assistance, he's been there several times, and he gave me a whole lot of directions and I made notes all along and so now I have transposed those notes onto this map. This is. National Geographic map of Death Valley National Park. Very nice, high detail, fantastic. We've also been using this. Now, I love maps. I owned a mapping business and how ah, lovely. I just love the way these maps are drawn. So we've been using this and we will also use this. Now, I haven't done a lot of navigation using an iPad, uh, but this time I'm gonna try it using a program called Topo Maps. It's an app store, I got it off the App Store, it was about $8. And the good thing about Topo Maps is it allows you to download government topographics, which are one in 50,000, and of course, lots and lots of detail. And they're free. All you have to do is pay the eight bucks for the program. You don't pay per map. So, and it was recommended to me and very, very nice. And what I've done here, in the green area are all the maps of Death Valley that I have downloaded and the little blue dot there indicates we are just off the map and we'll be crossing east, north, northeast and then further south and we'll be using a combination of these four things to find our way. See you in the desert. Fall instead of rain Our first glimpse of Death Valley over the small town of Big Pine. This is a, a realization of a dream for me personally. Death Valley, I mean, come on. As a kid, hearing about Death Valley, the name Death Valley. I'm here.
after all of the the traveling that I've done through my life and it's always been one of those one of those things on the bucket list it's always been on the bucket list and here it is we are not three or four miles into the actual national park the Death Valley National Park and there it is that's actually not Death Valley that's that's the Eureka Dunes Valley and and the, 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 it actually consists of two main mountain ranges we've crossed over one and there are two parallel valleys and we'll be driving along the valleys over the hill long valleys over the hill along the so much history and of course towards the end the lowest part well below sea level lowest part of North America and the hottest place on earth that's what we'll be going to uh, enjoy over the next few days this place in the bottom of the Eureka Valley has a very original name it's called deep sand hmm but it's interesting there are signs all along saying no driving off-road and there's a very good reason for it those that that's a baby that's a that's a that's an infant when it comes to dunes over in the other part of the valley we're surrounded by mature dunes and they've been stabilized by plant life and they're no longer flowing they're no longer moving the only thing that happens with them is a little bit of dust is taken off the top by the wind but these actually move in this confined area it's a moving set of dunes and in the base of the dunes you can see the plants actually forming in its early attempts to stabilize that as well one set of wheel tracks over any one of these dunes will destabilize at the moment the rain falls it collapses the stabilized dune and does huge damage to the ecology from driving across open valleys the first mountain pass looms ahead hmm this looks interesting okay we seem to have a um not sure if this is a problem or what but uh a width problem and the biggest uh, challenge to us at the moment in terms of uh, this trail is tire damage and uh, it's close but we can get through interesting it does say on the map experienced four-wheel drive uh, required and now I see why. That's narrow. But you know, other vehicles the size of ours must have come here through through here before. So definitely going to require some guidance. Um, I'll go first. I'm in the Death Valley National Park, California, traveling with my wife Gwyn and my good friend Jeremy James. We're both driving Toyota Tundra four-wheel drive pickups. Mine is a 2003 with a 4.7 litre V8 and Jeremy's is a later model with the 5.7 V8. The temperature reading says 100 on the gauge, but the wind makes it nice and cool. This is the first obstacle that we've come across in the valley. It's called Steel Pass. And I'm sitting here in my driver's seat wondering why did they call it Steel Pass? Okay. Maybe you need parts of your anatomy that are made of steel to cross this pass. Whatever it is, it's actually too narrow for these wide vehicles. Okay, that's the first one. Uh... A little easier than I thought it was going to be. I think I got a little bit nervous because it's an unfamiliar vehicle. You know, I don't know it. Uh, this is more difficult. But I have a little bit more confidence than I had when I started. Straight on, straight on. Uh, okay. I want you to hold that line. You're going to come this way a little bit once your mirror clears. Okay, is the vehicle going to tilt a lot? I'm just worried about the height in this rock. But to save the camper, we probably should go over about one foot. And what's going to happen is you're going to climb all the way up that rock high and it's going to tilt it this way, but you shouldn't clear that way. 
So you think it'll be better if I'm further, a little bit over? Yeah, with the camper, yes. Oh, vehicle. And you're just gonna come straight on, and we'll watch. I'll watch the camper. That's the line you want, and I think we're gonna be okay with that if you can get up it. I can. If I if I use us a little bit more speed just to get over this hump. There you go. I'm gonna be safe. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. No differential locks. If I can get you about three inches higher, I think we can get it. I've got to come on flat onto the onto the face. Yeah. Because we, we're trying to save the height. Right. And the penalty is we're just twisting up. I think that I need to actually go back. Come this way. And it's a much steeper climb, but it's at least it's flat. Okay. And your back tire is going to be on that lower deep rock. Stay right there. I'm going to see if I can get a rock in there. See if you can get on that. I'm so terrified of smacking this canopy right. on this thing because it'll, it'll damage it very badly if I do it. I really don't want to do it. They come straight at us. I'll keep an eye on the camper. Beautiful. You cleared it by about two inches. You just got it. Okay, well, we two down, two to go. Two to go. Let's do the next one. Do you one. think yours is going to be easier or more difficult than this? I think it's going to do easier because yes. you don't have the height. I don't have the height to swing. And you have a locker. And I've got a locker. So we'll know if the newer Tundra fixed their traction in a moment. All right. We'll do. Okay. I think we can work with this angle right here. This is making me sweat. So your guide, Not that the obstacle is particularly difficult, is but it's a very wide vehicle and I'm really worried about damaging it. The rule in this business is, you damage a vehicle, you don't get another one. This is your target. That was easy. That was easy. That was an easy one. Okay, I'm gonna park up here and help you. I mean, I know it's art and all that, but <laughs> really. <laughs> you hold that, I'm gonna give you that GoPro and you can put it in your cab. You just, I'll and just, and if you think I'm a complete idiot and giving you the wrong directions, you're free to say so. I'll cut it out. Of course end, you will, yeah, yeah, program, no, yeah. But you can, I'll have you know, my GoPro running too that's not edited. Uh, it's, it's a nice, ni balmy 97. Balmy 97. Balmy 97. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Let's do it. Okay, good. And you're gonna you're gonna rub your back tire on this rock here. If you do that, your front tire will be clean on that side. Got it. Perfect. Straighten it a little bit. Go back this much and come forward smoothly. Whoa, perfect. Nice and smooth. Jeremy is doing very well. He seems to be keeping the drive smoother than I was able, and it's making a lot of difference. And of course, his rear differential lock is making even more difference. Beautiful, perfect. Okay, whoa. Okay, and about this much, your back wheel's gonna lift, your front wheel's gonna lift. You're gonna leave your steering exactly as you are now. 
and you're going to come forward nice and smoothly as you are now because there's a quite a sharp rock there got it but you're you're, you're looking pretty good okay okay You're just gonna, as it comes up, this one comes up the steepest, a little bit left to, flat, to, to flatten it and then right. right. Let's see what happens. This is day one of our expedition and it's become very technical and a great way to demonstrate the vehicles. But I am concerned. There are supposedly more challenging passes ahead of us. Turn right. That's your line. That's where you're going to leave the steering wheel and you're going to give it a bit of a woof. I'm just going to check the other side. You're good the other side. You've got plenty of clearance. Okay, nice and smooth. Woof. Right. There you go. You did it. Brilliant. Need some water? I'd love some water. Uh, so how was that? that. Hey? That was fantastic. That was bloody that good was fun, great. eh? That was great direction. That was good fun, that was. You were literally from your bodywork on that side. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and then went like this, and it just moved over, and it was, I just suddenly saw light in that gap. <laughs> well, the art, the art is not letting me know that. <laughs> As Bill Burke would say, stop looking at your car, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Just. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Look at me! <laughs> uh. Oh, here you go, Popsy. Have some water. So, uh, it's uh, it's been a lot a, a long day. The, there were no there were no indications on the map on how long each of the routes would actually take, and it's been slower than we thought. And we were trying to make uh, some hot springs. And there was a campsite there, apparently there are showers, um, but I don't think we're going to make it there tonight. We might continue a little bit longer, or we might camp in this unspeakably beautiful valley. It occurred to me today while driving through Death Valley that while there are many magnificent places in Nor North America, to visit wild camp, wilderness areas like this. We're utterly alone. The North American population is at a significant disadvantage to many other countries around the world. And I look at these two vehicles. Toyota Tundra, one is a 2003 model. One of them, I think that other one's about, a, I think it's a 2012, 11 or 12 model. The fuel consumption is it defies description when I think about what I have to put up with in terms of vehicles and the fuel they use. Now these vehicles have a range in this terrain of 200 miles. It's about 300 kilometers. And yet they carry this weight and th these, are, these are amongst the best of the overland trucks available in the United States. You know, th th the Tundra is really well respected. Why do you put such tiny tanks in them? And the consumption is ruinous. It really is, it really is something to, to behold. We've done 50 miles since fill up. I'm under three quarters of a tank. Uh, you guys have it rough. No diesels, very few diesels, all big petrol engines. You have my sympathy. Later that morning, the track is rough, slow and squeaky and hot. We are looking forward to the hot spring oasis. It has taken us uh, about two and a half hours to do what I thought last night would take us maybe another hour. So our 
our uh, decision to not continue on to the oasis was a good one. It turned out besides the valley was just magnificent and as, as is this. But this is a true oasis. Um, there are hot springs and we're going to go and investigate it now. This is a, a nudist colony. Well, not a nudist colony, but it is well known that people come here and take all their clothes off. Uh, and this is why. <laughs> this water's warm. It's not just warm, it's bath warm. An extraordinary thing to find in this, in this wilderness. No, I'm not expecting this to be overly refreshing. I don't have keys on me or anything like that. Uh, oh, it's actually, it's, it's hot. This is only going to be refreshing when I get out. Ah, oh, it's hot. Whoopsie, come in soon. You're windy. All deserts should have one of these. We should make it compulsory. Perfect time for a cold one. The history of the pools. Uh, somebody went to the trouble of building this. Ah, it's cold for the wind. <laughs> it's a hot cold, hot cold, hot, hot cold. Hot Between cold. December 26, 1967 and 1st January 1968, two families and their friends, looks like young kids, put this together and, and created these pools in which to swim. There are three of them in the immediate area. They are all hot springs and there is a cold spring a uh, quarter of a mile down the road. That one doesn't have a, a constructed swimming pool but you can swim in it and that water is cold. Isn't that lovely that a family just decided, hey, let's build a pool. Magic. This is very obviously a place that people visit reasonably frequently. With all the effort they put in cleaning the pools and toilet and even reading matter while you're on the bog. Toilet, restroom, California gold. What a more appropriate title, I couldn't think of one. Now I know somebody who let the constipation get the better of him. Let's go. Like uh, they might have carried um, electric cables, some kind of conveyor. There are four of them are going up the valley, but uh, they've obviously been here for a long, long time. And uh, it's I think the ambience must be here. Must be 40. We must be must be 45 degrees now. They are in fact relics of a salt tram, a system of conveyors taking salt from the Saline Valley up over the high hills. Operated by the Saline Valley Salt Works, it was abandoned in 1930. This pass is called Lippincott. Like Steel Pass, it says on the map, experienced four-wheel drive required. We'll take a look and then... Uh... So you reckon that, you reckon that tea, we're not gonna get to tea? Uh, tea kettle junction. Yeah, I don't think so. It's pretty tight. Part of the, the road was at almost this steep of a grade. Come like, all this thick, this like right, right here. here. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much... We didn't think we'd make a few of the... Uh, uh, shoot. So, we started walking by foot for a little bit and just to kind of see how much... How and we just decided, no, it's not worth it.
two guys driving enormous pickup trucks. The one at the back was a Dodge double cab long bed. I mean, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I'm saying eight meters long. Vehicle in the front, there was no tread on the tires. I'm, I mean, actually, Jeremy pointed this out. He thinks that these guys are complete rookies and that they're, they're not equipped for this kind of driving. So perhaps when they said, you know, they couldn't get through, you can't get through, you can't get through, they were wrong. But we won't know until we get there. The choice is to go back down in the valley and camp in that howling gale or push forward. And the place we're going to tonight is called Tea Kettle Junction. I have a funny feeling it's more American eccentricity, but that's what we're going to try and make there tonight. Hopefully the pass is not too tough. I have no idea if they went this far, whether they turned around. Um, so I don't know if it's worse ahead, but it's certainly steep. There you go, Lippincott Pass, four-wheel drive, high clearance, no tow, no tow service. That's a little bit obvious. Uh, that was, in terms of sheer drop, the steepest pass I've ever, I've ever traveled. I actually, one moment, mm, had the old gulp and kept my mouth closed so Gwyn wouldn't panic. In the valley ahead of us is the racetrack. I have no idea why it's called the racetrack. They call this area the racetrack. They call this a player, not a pan, a player. It's very, very different from a pan. It has no crusty surface. In fact, the surface is very slightly soft. All right, and they ask you, please never, never, never walk on it when it is wet because the footprints stay for, well, forever. And it is also famous for moving rocks and I'm being serious. The rocks move on their own. Let's see if this one will move. Go on then. Show us your stuff. Okay, it hasn't, it's not moving. We could wait longer. I'm not kidding actually. They say that they, I mean, they see tracks across the surface and then a rock. The, the rock has obviously moved. So, why would a rock move on its own? And the, the, the scientists are not sure because it's never actually been witnessed. But they speculate that the area, that the, the surface becomes so slippery, and of course the wind blows here incessantly, that the wind can literally push a 200 pound rock across the surface. Wouldn't that be amazing to watch? We could stay longer, but I don't think we will. Ah, you're just, you're just fooling us, aren't you? Just sitting there smug like that. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, fifty, fifty one, fifty two, fifty three, fifty four, fifty five. Andrew, where's the lens cap? Uh, it's uh, on the driver's seat. Oh, okay, Kay. thanks. Uh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How is that sky? Isn't it fantastic? All day we've had these amazing skies. Very eventful day and I'm worn out. I'm in California's Death Valley National Park. It's daybreak at Tea Kettle Junction. Traveling with Gwyn and a close friend Jeremy James, 
we've been experiencing everything Death Valley has to offer. Fantastic, fantastic day and culminating in uh, Tea Kettle Junction. It's history, challenging passes, huge skies, hot springs well, I'm not expecting this to be overly refreshing. and moving rocks or in our case a stubborn rock. Tomorrow we are going to have a look at a few of the touristy spots of Death Valley. Most people have come to Death Valley and that's what they know of it. That's, that's what they remember. That's, that's Death Valley to them. But of course to us it's been very, something very, very different. And uh, tomorrow night we may leave the area depending on time. Generally our, our travel times have been longer than we expected. So, uh, but we're not sure what's happening tomorrow. But what we are doing is we're missing out a short piece because, well, we've run out of fuel. We have enough to get to ourselves to a refueling point, but there is a section that I wanted to do. Can't do it. Just don't have enough fuel. And the first of the tourist spots we're going to visit is this one. This is the Ubi Hebe crater, actually only about 2,000 years old. And, and it was a significant event here and in this area that is actually part of why Death Valley looks like it does today. Only 2,000 years ago, this was a massive a, a bubble of hot steam and gas that exploded. So it's not a meteorite crater, it's a volcanic crater. And it is, I can see why now, there's a parking lot here. This is one of the most popular spots in Death Valley for regular visitors. Okay, this, this place has a great name. It's called Furnace Creek. What a brilliant name, what an apt name, because, well, we're gonna stay here the night but before we go to our camping spot, we are going to the hottest place on earth and we're doing it on purpose. So now we're going to a place called Badwater Basin. It is the point in Death Valley that all tourists want to visit. They want to visit for a few reasons and I think the main one is that it is the hottest place on earth. The hottest temperature ever recorded on this planet was recorded at Badwater Basin. And one of the reasons it's so hot is because it is so far below sea level. This is my first ever experience below sea level. And when we get there, I'll tell you how hot it is. It's May, it's gonna be hot, but not that hot. One of the challenges have been, has been to, to figure out how long it would take us to get certain places and, and my big mistake was that I didn't realize how big this place is. It is the largest uh, park in North America outside of Alaska. It is absolutely vast and I'm standing now in Bad Water Basin. It is well over 200 feet below sea level and in the distance the valley that this area gets its name. The hottest place ever recorded on earth was recorded right here and right now it's pretty close to that so I'm not gonna stick around Furnace Creek campground I have two things to say about it firstly very very hot secondly don't come here it was probably 35 degrees by the time we actually went to bed and during the night, the temperature plummeted to 34. Um, and uh, uh, what astonished me is that we arrived here, we've been in the wild for four nights, we're a bit grubby, we're a bit dirty, come here. And one of the main reasons why you come to a camping site that is established is that there will be services like a shower. This camping site goes on for half a kilometer at least that way and a third that way during high season how many people would be camping here a thousand probably not far off how many showers serve a thousand people two 
and it's half a kilometer that way. It's a half a kilometer walk that way. memories of a wonderful trip, we leave Death Valley and head to Nevada. Right, so, <clears throat> big sky country, this is Nevada we've left behind us. Death Valley, we've climbed up, we're now well above sea level, and the open plains of Nevada. And of course, the moment you cross the state line into Nevada, you know it's Nevada because there's always a casino. And in this particular case, the most interesting signpost I have ever seen in my entire life. Hot sauce? What do they do with it? Here we go then, Las Vegas. Happy? Good, so am I. I'm sorry, I don't like Las Vegas. Time to leave. Total contrast to the day before, it is now raining. So there, you can see Arizona. We have passed through Utah, we're now in Arizona, and we're on our way to the Expo West in Flagstaff. Before we go there, I'm gonna spend some time in the Grand Canyon, and I think I can find an amazing campsite, again, wild camping. Last year I went there and stayed in the tourist areas and photographed it, and it was very nice, but it was very touristy. And now I'm going to go and spend some time while camping, but I don't know how good the instructions I've been given are. I'm going to be able to find it and I'm getting very, very wet and it's actually quite cold. Okay, Gwen. Uh, okay, you good? We've got to go back to the car. Give me the camera. I'll put it under my thing to protect it from the rain. Come on. Okay. Let's go. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, don't slip. Let's go. This is where local knowledge really pays dividends. I was told about this beautiful place right on the edge of Grand Canyon, just before the Grand Canyon National Park. We just entered the, 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 the National Park and we saw campsite full. But the idea of going into a campsite full is just nightmare time. And you see people have just pulled over and camped. That's the beauty. Amazing contrast. In altitude, we are at about 9,000 feet. Day before yesterday we were at under 200 feet below sea level. Again, extremes over, over very, very short distances. You might find, we might find that all of those people like us have arrived campsite, campsite full and they've gone to find alternative places to camp. It'll either be miserable because there'll be hundreds of other people or it'll be sublimely fantastic right on the edge of the canyon. It'll be one of those two. Okay. Look at this. Ah, there's a, a strong, fantastic smell of dampness in the forest. I'm going to take a little walk. You see, there's one guy over there, a little tent over there. That's all he is, just on his own. There. It is raining. I must get my jacket. But I just, I really just wanted to show you. I mean, this is a Grand Canyon. Look, look over there. Look, that's, that, that's it. Can you see it? Nor can I. I'll get myself a jacket. And now I present to you, in all its majesty, the Grand Canyon. So, in the early part of the series I mentioned that, that I was building a camper, my six wheel drive, and that the camper had to be suitable for exterior and interior viewing. Now many of you in South Africa, maybe Australia too, maybe other parts of the world would be saying, well, why do you want to, I mean the whole point of camping is being outside. I couldn't agree with you more. That's why we do this. However, in conditions like this, you actually want to be inside. Now if it had been really windy at this very moment, 
it would be miserable out here. The rain is quite strong, so it's, I mean, we're getting wet. That's not terrible. But we can get totally dry and totally comfortable in there. That's why this camper that I'm going to develop has a dual personality. Man, it's wet. So now, your new camper, <laughs> does this help the design? The weather we've been having while we've been traveling? Oh, for sure. Um, we had unbelievably hot weather in Death Valley. Furnace Creek was mind-bendingly hot for someone who now lives in England. Um, and then into this, still ice on the ground outside. I mean, that's cold. And it's raining. Um, and camping in the rain is never fun. Being in a nice place is fun. In the rain, not so much. So being able to come inside and be dry and relatively comfortable, cook a meal. Um, dry socks. Dry socks, <laughs> those were washed. Uh, makes a big difference, it really does. I feel so sorry for Jeremy and Ashton. They're outside hoiking up tarpaulins compared to we're in five-star luxury here. Now, <clears throat> here's the rub. Jeremy is actually half American Indian. His father. So uh, we'll see if the, the ancient skills are still there, or whether years in Oregon and Seattle have erased them completely. Let's see. Take your bets, folks. Oh, sorry, we're not in, <coughs> not in Nevada. Can't do that. What is obvious is there has been some advance. Jeremy is not using the traditional way of rubbing sticks together, but rather a fire lighter from Walmart. Well, if it doesn't work, it's probably because I'm the low man on the totem pole. It looks like we're trying to make a fire. What we're really trying to do is make coffee. <laughs> uh, we're just going to have to circle the wagons and go. I'm trying to send a smoke signal that says this wood is very, very wet. Okay, a little break in the clouds. Now can you see it? No, nor can I, not really. But I'm getting a glimpse. Tomorrow morning that is going to be unbelievable. I've been spending a bit of time this morning trying to set up my camera but it's been a bit difficult because uh, people here, a lot of the people know me for my videos and everything. Of course this is the Overland Expo West in Arizona and it's my last campsite, campsite on my trip through uh, California, Nevada and, uh, and now finally Arizona. So I'll go through the little bit of the expo today and give you an idea of what it's about but I am continuing my personal quest on campers. How people in this country build and enjoy their campers because that's what I'm building for my vehicle in Australia later this year. So looking forward to a very, very busy event. The camper that I've been enjoying for the past seven days is the four-wheel pop-up camper. Others of interest here include the XP camper, the camper with no obvious name, and this, the Earth Roamer. The Earth Roamer is, well, how, do I, how do I put this? Um, it's big. So the refrigerator inside. Is it's nicer electric, than my lounge. Much nicer. And given the look on Gwyn's face, she's thinking exactly what I'm thinking. Do these people take this over landing? How could they? It's far too large for the trails of Death Valley. That's really my question. 
I I don't know if I can answer that. I mean, it, it does very well on switchback. No, off, it doesn't. No vehicle this low. big does well Hello, on switchbacks. Um, it does well in all weather conditions. Yes, I'm sure it does. There is enough entertainment equipment on board, and it has such a nice kitchen that one never, ever need go outside. Where are Earth Roamer users taking their vehicles? They take these all throughout Colorado, Alaska, um, on washboards. The owners have buried the rear wheels in sand, um, deflated the tires, and gotten the truck out. Um, so, you know, it's meant to take luxury off grid. Fair enough. Luxury off grid. That does not mean luxury off road. Not necessarily those tight switchbacks that you, maybe you've yeah. experienced, but yeah. I think as an owner, you have to understand that maybe that's not what the truck's suited for. Okay. You're just going to come straight on. And we'll watch, I'll watch the camper. Earlier this week, this is what I had to cope with. And that's the subject of another video. The line you want, I think we're going to be okay with that. If I, if I use this a little bit more speed just to get over this hump. There you go. I'm going to be safe. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So I have no differential locks. Had the vehicle been even slightly bigger than this, we would not have completed this trail. But it's certainly capable of, it's a four-wheel drive truck going off-road, going through mud, going through... Which means it's severely limited by its size as to where it can go and how much fun you can have with it. I'd probably live in this. Well, so all the pink jeans... Not bother with the house. Go to Snabbly Hill. Ah, uh, that's good, just as well, because it costs more than the house. Is there anything about this one that you like? Can you see obvious, anything obvious that you like? My feeling about this is it's, it's glamorous. I mean, this is the Ritz. This um, is the XP Camper, um, the larger one. But I actually cannot see myself pulling this up 45 degree gradient kind of thing that we were doing in Death Valley. I just can't see it. This is never going to take some washboards. Imagine that in a wash, over a washboard. My experience with the four-wheel camper has been fantastic in two different ways. Firstly, as an experience of a live-in, live-out of canopy camper. So tonight, uh, for supper, uh, pasta with mushrooms we bought in the store on a pickup North American market very much live in because of bad weather and live out because there are a lot of desert areas where the weather is very nice and lovely combination and that's what I'm building. So to be in, to be able to experience a, a, a quality camper, it's a very popular unit in this country, um, first hand for two weeks in the desert with a mixture of weather has been fantastic. I have learned more in the last 10 days than I could ever have learned at all the outdoor overland trade expos for 10 years. The other part is that I've learned that I get so annoyed so quickly with equipment that is badly made, badly designed, that is frustrating to use and it's my pet peeve when I come across a piece of equipment that is just plain bad. And it annoys me because, I mean, annoys those people around me because I tend to rant and rave when I see something that is just not right. Well, honestly, I mean, a, a camper like the four-wheel camper, and I thought, well, there are lots of elements to it. There's the water system, there's the heating system, there's the cooker, there's the packing system, there's the fridge, there's the bed, the way the bed climbs, you know, all of these different elements, the ventilation. You know, there are so many different elements that I could either love or hate. Complete honesty here. There isn't a single thing about the four-wheel camper that has annoyed me. Not one single thing. I really wish that I could have found something that I could rant about. Right, now where's Gwyn gone? Um, oh, there she is. This is the Jeep kitchen, as if you couldn't tell. What happens is these two walls, everything comes assembled as you see. It's two cabs, one for your refrigeration, one for all of your storage, and down the bottom you have another cabinet which will hold whatever type of stove unit you carry. So you can choose your type of stove and your type of fridge to insert. The unit empty weighs about 100 pounds. Very light, very durable. It has enough storage for months. <laughs> 
of ideas worth of food and it rolls out and glides. Each one of these rails holds about 150 pounds. They have a little rubber stopper so you can really slot it in and secure it with these customized locks. The beauty of it is these rails also don't, don't rattle on road. So you get to use the actual locking system, make sure it's secure, and then you can go just about anywhere. The lower drawer has two locking systems so that when you're stable somewhere, you can lock in the back side and the middle and then it will be really secure so when you're cutting and things, it doesn't roll in or out on you. I think back to all the, the trucks that we've had that have had a tailgate or open at the back and you're just confronted with all the space. Yes. And we've always put in roller draw systems and they've always worked well. But I saw this and I thought, now, now you're seriously intelligent because you want to stop and you just want to make something quickly to eat. You don't want to unpack the whole truck. You just want to make something for lunch. Exactly. It's right there. What well, such an intelligent idea. And what's the great feature is that you actually have this top shelf. So when you pull out normally your cooler and all the other gear, you've got the heaviest things are on the bottom and everything collapses on top. So now you just pull it out, glide over, cut up whatever it is you want for lunch or make something warm and you're gone in 20 minutes. And trailers, which don't interest me overly much. And fridges, always of interest. I've decided which fridge I'm going to use in my vehicles, not represented at the expo this year. Water tanks and of course interesting 4x4s. This is an Austrian Pinskauer. Defenders and a G-Wagon with a very dubious roof rack fitting. Beautifully restored Land Cruiser and a t-shirt for me. 79 dual cab, my next vehicle. Expo West is a three-day event which makes it very easy to revisit those stands best visited alone. Last year in the snow, a stranger, a fan obviously, came to see me and such a wonderful gesture, he brought me a Coke. And he'd seen my shows and knows that I like a nice cold Coke. What a lovely gesture it was and I mentioned it in last year's video. Uh, this is where I sp <coughs> spent part of my day uh, yesterday and this is called the author's table. It snowed all night, well snow, rain, snow, rain and uh, somebody yesterday did such a wonderful gesture. It was, it was just so touching. You know I like a coke and in my videos it's often I mean I'm holding a coke and uh, he brought me a coke. So this year no fewer than five people have come by and brought me cokes. The great part is that we see this is no ordinary coke. This is Mexican coke. It's made with cane sugar and not corn syrup and it tastes fantastic. So I also like <clears throat> I also like Rolex. Oh yes Yesterday, somebody came along and gave me a Rolex. What a nice gesture that was. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you haven't already, subscribe and click the notifications bell so you don't miss our weekly videos.